Grid Kids. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 7 of the Grid Kids podcast, and I'm your host, as always, Nicholas Semrod. Today's guest is an innovator in the truest sense of the word. He's played drums for everyone from Michael Brecker to Wayne Krantz and Michelle Camilo, and he's written music for some of the biggest movies ever made, including Iron Man and Transformers. And most importantly to me, he has constantly pushed the boundaries of what's possible technologically in regards to music. Our guest today is the one and only Mr. Zach Danziger. Now, I know that I've been playing clips of the previous few artists so that you could hear what they're about before the interview, but in regards to Zach's work, I'm simply going to encourage you to head on over and search for Zach's TED Talk from a few years ago. Honestly, it's one of the most fascinating things I've ever seen, and I think it's sort of the perfect representation of the types of boundaries that Zach is constantly pushing. So feel free to take a quick peek at that for a better perspective before or after you listen to this interview. And without further ado, here's my interview with Mr. Zach Danziger. Hey, everybody. I am here with Zach Danziger, drummer, producer extraordinaire, performer extraordinaire, and you just got done doing a Spectrosonics shoot. No, no, no. A pre-production meeting. Oh, so you didn't actually do the shoot oh, yet. Oh, that's Monday. I am No, so I was, I was there for about three, four hours just due to my own a giddiness Word, of, yeah. you know, showing them what I do with the electronics and how I do it. I said, why don't you outfit me with Bank of Sounds based on how I use these instruments? Mm-hmm. Eric was there and he programmed me sounds a lot quicker and a lot better than I could have done myself. Wow, and he's, he's such a beast with that stuff. And he does his homework, which is, that was the amazing part to me about that whole process. I, I did like a pre-meeting too. And I went in there and he had watched multiple videos of mine and like did a scouting report on, oh, here's how Nick uses his pedals. We spoke about this. To me, like that kind of dedication, like gear company people, this is advice to you. Th- that's why Eric Persing is killing the game right now and why his products are doing so well is because of efforts like that. And he's obviously, he's also a great musician, but he really just, he's doing it for the love of the products and, and music ultimately. And he gets mm-hmm. it and he respects musicians because he's a musician himself. It's not just a, a brainiac programmer guy uh, who can program code. He yeah. actually, he, he knows the the end product of, of his product. He knows the end result and, and mm-hmm. it makes a huge difference. He's always been way ahead of the curve with the products he makes. And uh, I'm not surprised. Man, yeah. yeah. I've, I was telling you before the start, I've never been a software instrument person. Mm-hmm. I mean, Keyscape is fabulous, but like the synth-based stuff on Trillion like saves my life. I mean, the yeah. fact that I, I can on the road not have to bust out an interface, like try and get a good sound and find power for my profit. And like, you know, in the US, that's no problem. But overseas, there's like one outlet yeah. half the time. And the fact that I can bring, you know, a little controller, like three faces with me and just plug in and there's perfectly dialed in like Juno patches and profit patches. Like it's really making my life like between that and splice. Like oh, yeah. I may actually be a producer at one of these. I think you already are. <laughs> Um, we met in New York, I think at the lesson Yeah, as tends to happen because I'm sort of a, a late bloomer in whatever the hell field of music I play. in. I think I experienced your electronic side, which wasn't the first thing you did. Like you, you had a whole pre <laughs> career mm. of like just drums. Yeah. When did you start playing? You mean like when did I first pick up drumsticks or when did I first do a gig? Or? Well, that's a great question. Um, like, those. yeah, when, when did you start studying? Yeah, my, my father, who's a piano player, took me for drum lessons when I was six or so. Grew up in a musical family, so I was always around music. So it wasn't like when I wanted to play the drums, it was foreign to my parents. It's like, sure. it's very obvious to them that I might want to do something musical. But at one point, he tried to take me for lessons and the drum teacher at the time, now, me having taught drums, you know, in, in the past, I'm not so sure if I agree with the philosophy and what the drum teacher said. Not that he's, he's incorrect, but, you know, he told my dad it would take me too long to learn things 
when my hands aren't really developed, quote unquote. So as a six year old or seven year old, your hand like developed, does does he mean size wise? Or, you know, I think personally, he might have thought it might have been a drag to teach a seven year old. That's my take on it. Yeah. But he told my dad, let him come back when he's a little older. (laughs) So we put that on hold, but I was still, you know, I had a drum set around uh, the house. My uncle had a drum set because he used to play drums too professionally and he lent me drums. So I was not serious and I might have not taken it up again till 10 and a half, close to 11. And then that's when I started taking lessons around and 11 years And you ended up at the Drummer's Institute at what age? Drummer's 15? Collective. Drummer's Collective at 15, yes. right? You mean studying? Yeah. No, 12. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. And that's like, that's what- I, I started teaching at 15. Okay. I was on wow. staff at 15. You were kind of like the young fireballer. You know, I feel like I've known a few of them now. And I'm curious as to if your experiences, you know, held true to any of the things that their experiences gave to them, like where you were you were brought up, you know, and, and you showed so much promise that there became like a level of expectation that came along with it. I don't know if back then I felt any expectation, but now looking back on it, I realized I might probably should have felt expectation. Really? But not at the time. Yes. At the time, I was just a kid who grew up in a musical family who liked playing the drums, started getting gigs at a young age, never thought I didn't belong there. Like, I now feel that I didn't belong there. Mm. But when I was 16, 17 years old, I was doing a lot of jazz gigs with, like, a lot of top players. You know, I don't mean to say this in any to my own horn way, but, like, I really was, you know, and not for one second did I feel like I shouldn't be there. Mm-hmm. Looking back now, I go, no way should I have been there. <laughs> I never would have hired me. <laughs> what What does current day Zach Danziger tell 10-year-old Zach Danziger about music? Nick, come on. No, 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 no this is a good question. Yeah, no, th- that's a great question. Here's what I would say. While I had a lot of success when I was younger, and, you, and of course you get a lot of pats on the back, especially from friends and family, but you'll get that 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 one off, you know, whether it's based rooted in just slight envy or slight truth, even you'll get that person who's going to kind of speak their mind and try to shoot you down a little bit. And again, at that time, I couldn't fathom why. And now, not only did I understand why, but I kind of even agreed with it. So, what I would tell a younger version of myself or, or a young version of it is like, here's the thing: no matter how good you are, a ten-year-old phenom a 15-year-old phenom is still underdeveloped relative to how they're going to be. And to expect that person at 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 even to be a finished product and to have the seasoned feeling as a player or any profession you're in, that's that's impossible to demand that of somebody who doesn't have the experience. So you could be this hotshot at 15 years old, and I might have thought I was. And a couple of times people were just like, Give him some time and he'll develop into something decent. I'm, and I'm thinking, give me time. I'm already, de-, you know, <laughs> they were right. And I, I feel even more now mm. at the age I'm at, I feel even less there now than I did at 15 or 20. And that's a good sign to me to yeah. realize how much more room you have to grow and, you, and how- You're knowing what you don't know. Clearly. And, and, I, and you don't want to let that get the best of you because some people- let that paralyze them. They never make a record. They never do a gig because they're Mm -hmm. not quite ready yet. Mm -hmm. And that's not good either. But I think some balance between fearing because you know you have a lot to figure out, but also being brave to do it anyway, because it's the only way you're going to really grow Mm. um, and push yourself into things like, you know, you and I did a gig last week. And I thought to myself, if it's a gig under my own name these days, I don't want to do something that is a compromised or really half-assed version of what I've been spending years on, which is a lot of this electronic and multimedia manipulation. Mm-hmm. So I took it as a challenge, and I, I wanted to find you know a way that if I was going to do it with someone I've never done it with, with yourself, I didn't want to rehash old material, steal from other things I've done with collaborators, where I feel like it's both a slap in the face to them and you to just rehash like as if people are interchangeable because you bring something unique. When I play with Owen Biddle, he brings something unique. And and that's what's great about it. Sure. Anyway, if you want to be an exact clone of somebody as a player, or if you just want to be a drummer who plays a style of music authentically where it reminds you of the great, you know, if you want to sound exactly like Bernard Purdy, it'd be fantastic because Bernard Purdy's a fantastic drummer. Mm-hmm. However, 
someone will always say, wow, you're great, just, you know, but, but they won't cite you as something that they can only get from you. Mm. And that doesn't have to be any goal of any musician or any artist. It does not need to be a goal of that. Mm. But somehow, little by little, I've steered myself in a direction where if I can't do something that seems totally original, mm. I feel like it is not me. And sure. I almost feel like this is not even the same career I'm in. Yeah. And it's, it's self-induced sort yeah. of uh, parameters, but yeah. that's where I've taken it. So I would tell a younger Zach, you've got to copy people. I copy people to this day. Mm. It's just that I draw from so many things to copy. Now it's a collage. It's a collage. You know, yeah. um, I love food. So like, you know, you go and taste this thing you've never tasted before. And maybe there's an ingredient or two you've never even heard of. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes there's chicken in it and there's an <laughs> onion and there's a carrot <laughs> and there's this. Mm -hmm. And you've opened an oven and you've put oil in the pan and yeah. you've shoved it in the oven. Which is none all of things these, that yeah, aren't yours. Yeah. None of those things are your idea. Yeah. But the the blend and the and the concept that overarches everything is something you've never tasted before. Yeah. So nothing's really original. But if you can steal from the right places mm -hmm. and in a broad spectrum, then you've got your own recipe. Yeah. I think that the copying musical angles. When I teach, for instance, like there's a specific range where if I can tell someone hasn't seen enough, I'm like, man, go check out, like learn miles, learn this, learn that, learn that. But there's a very clear point where I'm like, okay, you've done that, but now you just sound like those people mm -hmm. and you sound like bad versions of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oftentimes, yeah. Um, I get a lot of people learning Corey's Lingus solo. That's like the modern the modern version of learning Herbie solo on, you know, chameleon or something mm -hmm. like that. I'm giving Corey a lot of credit here, <laughs> but uh, it's fabulous solo. It's like super legendary solo, really great playing. And I get so many people who are like, yeah, man, I got to learn that. I got to be obsessed with it. And I try and remind them like, that's cool. Like do that. If you want to learn it, learn it, take things from it, but realize that that's a, that's not going to make you him. And even if you were to take down every single person, like every single Corey Henry solo, every single Herbie solo, Bill Evans, whatever, you still haven't lived what they lived. You haven't been to the places they've been. And you also haven't gotten from their influences. So like your thing is like, um, it's like that bad Michael Keaton movie where he carbon copies himself yeah. like five times and the fourth or fifth one is like off. <laughs> like even if you're the best copier of you know Corey henry like you're still not as good as him like you're not as honest and you're not coming from a place that he is right. and and i think that's all hearable like pretty quickly mm -hmm. you know i yeah. mean and and i hope that's not controversial but like there becomes a point where you know like you're saying you have to be able to say okay cool i worked on Corey for a while now let me go work on this now let me go work on this yeah and even if it's one genre like even if you're just a jazz or even if you're just a metal guy like whatever you're doing if you take from 10 different people, at least you have a, like a fucking recipe. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> and, and, and along those lines, and I'll tell you, I'm not sure how healthy this is, but I'm, I'm guilty of doing something <laughs> like this. So listen, people turn you on to things. You know, you don't just know of things. People mm -hmm. tell you to check something out, you know? Mm -hmm. But I do think maybe it's slightly more enriching if you get turned on to something that isn't like the most popular thing yet. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I was younger, I went and heard the Chicory Electric Band. I was like 14 years old. I had no idea who the band was. I just knew that it, I liked Chicory's music because I heavy influence at that age. <laughs> yeah. I went to see them live and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Mm. I, I didn't know the drummer's name. And I've decided that day, you know, at that moment, that's the best drumming I'd ever seen in my life by far. I can't believe how great what I'm watching is. I found out when this guy was playing, turn of Dave Weckl, hmm. I was 14 years old with my father at every one of those gigs, watching this with a, with a Walkman, recording the gigs, taking it home, slowing it down on my half-speed recorder to figure out what this guy was playing. That's killing. You Now, so many people, due to the internet and his videos, and everyone can slow everything down and he can explain everything. People can look like he's amazing, but I know how to play a lot of that because it's been so 
publicized. Mm -hmm. Back then, as a 14-year-old, mm -hmm. never having heard this guy's name, no one knowing who he was, no books on the topic, no internet, no nothing, I had to go labor and I had to find it. And the same thing happened to me in 1995 or 96, Aphex Twin, Square Pusher, and Luke Vibert. I heard this and again, changed my life. I never heard music like this. I never heard programming like this. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. But I, I went and I found what I thought was something to put my eggs in. Mm -hmm. And I felt the same way, even though the UK, people knew who Square Pusher was, nobody in New York on the, on the jazz front or mm -hmm. the fusion scene, no one knew who he was. Yeah. Trust me, because I was living it. No yeah, yeah. one knew who he was. Sure. The fact that they all do now makes me so gun shy to sit behind a drum set or to write a track that sounds like drum and bass because I feel like I'm copying. Sure, yeah, yeah. But meanwhile, if he was still under the radar, I'd feel more okay to like try to cut because it's like it felt like I had my own brain to arrive at what to what to be yeah. influenced by instead of like everyone knows it. Once everyone knows it, I feel like it's time to find something else that somebody doesn't. It's know. interesting you bring that up because I've I've tried to in the past year especially really dive into how I approach personally issues like that because I think I used to be an in kind of an unhealthy place with that. Like I would be very quick to say like, oh, that's exactly that other thing. Cute. You're straight up copying this. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, as of late, and I think I'm getting better at it, come from a place more of like utility with the whole thing of like, if you want to be a player that's getting hired for doing something unique, or you want to be a player that manages to keep finding work in a very busy crowd, that's one of the pieces is you have to say, okay, what's the crowd doing? Okay, cool. Let me have that too. But you also have to be able to understand that like, oh shit, there's a crowd that only knows that. So if I only know that, even if I love it, even if it's like, that's the fucking greatest shit I've ever heard. Even if you manage to get to the top of that crowd, you're still just a, like, kind of like everybody else. No, right, right, right. You know, and, and so it's, you, you find these other pieces and, and it helps you really stay sort of on the outside of that, which I think at least for, again, for utility is very beneficial because you work, you're always going to get work because, you know, there's only so many of those gigs. <laughs> and, and the thing is, a lot of those styles, as great as they are, they are trends that sadly go out of style. Yeah, oh, man, the Dilla thing in New York. I mean, I'm sorry, New York. I've, I've, I feel like finally after four or five podcasts, I can criticize New York a little more than I have. <laughs> uh, I've gotten in a little bit on it, but but that's a thing in New York that that I really hope dies a peaceful death <laughs> is is the neo soul thing. And it's not because it's bad. Like I, you know, God, people like Erica Badu shaped me more than fucking, you know, of a lot of people did. But but that is twenty three years ago. Yeah, and and if if that's still the new thing you're doing, well, that's then, what. Yeah, that's know. the thing. Yeah, we're not yeah. we're not disputing its greatness. Yeah, just like Dilla too. You know, it's it's uh, if you can do that, killing. But so can ninety percent of the musician population now. Well, what happens is once you pigeonhole yourself into like a limited scope of what your musical contribution is and and a lot of people do the same thing you get you get anonymous because you're just another guy who does that mm -hmm. or then it gets measured on who does it better if there is such a better like like you know i i'm a huge fan of the gospel chop stuff sure. i love it for reasons that i can enjoy certain aspects of it mm -hmm. the thing is what i do see happening is because it Sometimes it's a finite vocabulary and everyone seems to be aware of what that finite vocabulary is. Mm -hmm. Seemingly the only thing you can do with it is can you do it faster than the next guy? <laughs> because you're all working off the same vocabulary. Maybe mm -hmm. someone might do like, okay, a, a couple of more crossover moves. So someone might do- <laughs> a, a few less single stroke rolls. Yeah, or just, you know, I mean, there are things, there is a range, but but yeah. it does become like- if there's a guy faster who can do it, then that guy's going to be more of a wow factor. When, sure. you, when you're dealing with parameters that are so tangible and finite, mm. where if you can grab so many other things to your playing where you can't like get a finger on what, like if there's an elusiveness to somebody's style mm. because it comes from so many places, then that 
can already give you this uniqueness. And I'll mm-hmm. take it a step further. Like, I guess I'd call myself a drummer, but like, I, I worry so much more about computer programming and video editing and and synth sounds for my patches as I do drums. So mm-hmm. if like, for example, like I'm a big fan of Calm Trues. I like what he does, Hell yeah. you know, with his, with the way his synth sound. And if I decide I want to actually steal it verbatim, it's different than if I was just an electronic music producer trying to sound like his compositions and, and his synth sound. Then you're like, oh, another Calm Trues type. But mm-hmm. if I'm using an element such as like his synth sound, mm-hmm. I'm using one element or two elements of what I love so much, but within a, a context of mine that like has so many other things that you can mm-hmm. zero in on. So if you're going to like That's be inspired. That's the paprika of your recipe. <laughs> thank you. If you, if you want to steal from someone, steal directly, but maybe that's just a piece of something. Mm-hmm. So some, something else I, I wanted to bring up, I, I, this is, I think the first thing I've written down. Oh, nice. That we, we haven't even gotten to the question. Which is, yet. yeah, which Scared. is cool. Uh, we've, we've definitely mm. been on some other paths, which is great, but I, did enough homework to read some interviews and and I've played with you enough to kind of get some things with your playing to where first of all your your grid is fantastic. Well, I wouldn't be on this show with happily <laughs> titled if it wasn't. First of all you you you're incorrect but I'd take the compliment. Thing. Okay. <laughs> but there's there's something that I've I've played with more church drummers than I have anything else. Like wow. just, you know, around New York uh, yeah. in that hang, there's a lot of that. And yeah, yeah I, I love it. However, it promotes a very specific type of playing from someone who isn't the drummer. Mm. Um, I, you know, when I came to New York, I had, and I've mentioned this on this podcast before, but studied with this dude, Dana Murray, who was a drummer that played with Winton, killing drummer from back, uh, lives back in Omaha. And, um, you know, his whole thing was, was, the education was based a lot in, um, you know, have your own time. Like, don't you'd be like, get your own damn time. On the book. Oh, right, you know? right, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and not, not writing on his. And so our, uh, our practices, our lessons, and a lot of my early focus rhythm wise was kind of having my own world and not really trying to adapt if I didn't have to, to someone else's Yeah. and what the church thing did. And I, I, I suppose there's probably positives and negatives to this, but it really made me realize that, oh shit, everyone's grid moves a little differently. And if you're so rigid that you don't even try and, and understand the other person's, yeah. you're fucked. Yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> and, and what, what I was going to say about your playing is that playing with you, the, the way that I interpret your, grid because a lot of and i i read in i think it was the uh it was one of the interviews maybe the modern drummer interview Mm. you mentioned something about how how you're like my my time is really based on like kind of big idea like quarter note Mm. like that's my grid and the things in between that sometimes will go out of time but that but they're based within a very rigid thing almost like the way a conductor is conducting and you're looking at his broad strokes and just sort of getting in the The general uh, cadence of that stroke. Yes, and and so let's see if I can tie this together politically. <laughs> the, uh, the the way that I uh, have had to adapt to a lot of the gospel choppier drummers is is try and catch what I think they mean. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And with you, I can't do that, which is good because a lot of your things are free in between the yes, lines. Yes. Oh, I see. I, I have to trust, which is which. I, I think makes better music Be- because I enjoy I, it. I'm not sure yeah. if it's better or worse, but yeah, I, I love it because I'm, I'm trusting like, Oh shit, I can be in a place where I know that, that my quarter note is here mm-hmm. and I don't have to interpret what he's doing. And, yeah. and I, th- I feel like a lot of church drummers have put me into a place to where like, if I hear some like, Oh, he did dotted quarter time for a second I see, I and see, it was I a see. little quicker than where I thought <laughs> mine was. So let me dive on. Right. His- it seems like something you want to measure a little more as you're yes. playing along. Yes. And yeah, mine is exactly. so like anything goes that you can't even start to measure. And it's, f- dude, it's freeing. <laughs> really? I mean, <laughs> it, it's a, uh, so that's a, it sounds like a, it's a very strange compliment. No, I know. I mean, and I will tell you, I listen back to when I'm doing a lot of things. And in the moment, I'm thinking it's where I want it to be. And when I listen back, I'm jumping, jumping my own overarching sense of quarter sure. note. And I'd listen back and I'm like, that's not what I'd meant it to really be, but I'm not in uh, at the level of control yet that I want to be. Sure. So I can't do anything about it. So 
I kind of want to split the difference from, from somebody that's entirely on the money and robotic. Mm. And the way someone like Elvin Jones or Jeff Watts, when I used to hear Jeff Watts play in New York or Dijonette or people, and it sounds like cliche, you're naming the, the quote unquote greats I mean, or whatever, they're, but, they're but, the but truly, sure. yeah. Uh, you know, I think Elvin Jones had a comment that said, I forget, there might've been a question, but his either reply or this might've just been a statement flat out was, hey man, some fours take longer than others. <laughs> yeah. You know, and like, that's it. That's it for yeah. me. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I am definitely not always on the grid. I actually, for the most part, would like to be though. I don't mean yeah. perfectly, but like sure. in the ballpark. Yeah. Sometimes I'm nowhere near the ballpark. That's mm-hmm. when I'm not happy with it. Okay. But if it's a little like stretched, that's perfect. Mm-hmm. Like if it's like, if it wasn't metronomically there, but like you, you all felt it coming because you felt where the intention was, mm-hmm. that's great. Not that I get to educate lots of young drummers, but that would be one thing. I, I think would... you do whether you know it or not. <laughs> That would be one thing if, if I taught more drummers, I would I would mention like, you know, <laughs> well, know talking that, to them now. <laughs> and I'm one all of them. All right, young <laughs> young drummers, know that, too, old uh, drummers. that other people have to react to you. So what you do matters. <laughs> yeah. And but but it also goes both ways. Like drums are, are because they're so percussive and 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 sharp attacks and mm-hmm. many times note duration isn't there like with other instruments and stuff. It could be more malleable, like a bass mm. player could be right up on the time or a little bit more pliable, and it doesn't dominate like whether it, when a drummer is. Yeah, yeah, like a drummer is like roaring, and what he says goes many times, like it or not, and that's a shame. But the bass player can't always command that role, so it's always going to fall on the drummer. So yeah. it makes it hard for drummers, uh, yeah, absolutely, you know, to lock. But I have played with like bass players over the years, and it hasn't. It's not that they're great or not great, but just different approaches. Some that I feel work together with you, mm-hmm. and some that probably could do the same thing without listening to anybody in the band. Just be like, okay, I'm going to lay down this Here's part, where it is, yeah. and if I'm not constantly just listening to that, I'm done. Yeah, and if you try to push the time, they're not going to go. Wait a minute, I got to give in. He's the stronger of the two with the voice. Mm-hmm. They'll just hold firm, and you're just left in two different places, and that's scary. I just had this chat with uh, Mark Giuliano on the tour we just did, where he was talking about Avishai Cohen's time, and he said that he's like Avishai Cohen is the most rhythmically confident person I've <laughs> ever played with. It's good to hear that that the other instruments can occasionally take that role. They can. I mean, it even dives into some. Uh, it dives into some like alpha male kind of vibes where you're, you know, at least when I would approach the situation, it's like, how much do I, do I want to give in and let this be, you know, something that I really don't want it to be? Or do I want to seem like a huge prick and like keep it somewhere? Depends. <laughs> I think there's a point where the ship is sinking to such a degree that if, if we don't try to save it, sure. we're not doing the music yeah. any, any, you know, it, it's a disservice to not say something at that point. It's almost like a math problem. I, <laughs> yeah. I've brought this up in lessons too at points where it's like, if you have four people in the band, four people can't lay back. Right, it's because it, <laughs> it's all it, it's all uh, relative. Yeah, right? it's like you ha- you have. To, there's got to be something. I mean, even bringing this back to the Dilla stuff, it's like if you no really analyze that. that shit, something's on. It, yeah, it, it can't always just all be. Yeah, back. It's, no, it's, no, there's no, there's no. Uh, yeah, you don't have the contrast. And speaking of it's like someone like Lenny. What I love about Lenny's playing, mm-hmm. and I mean this as an actual compliment. Mm-hmm. It's not in perfect time. Yeah, yeah. And that's why it's good. Mm-hmm. And it's not that he can't play in time. Of course he can. Mm-hmm. It's a choice. It's yeah, yeah. a choice on feel. And it's a choice on shit. framing. <laughs> yeah. The snare sounds rushed because I've laid so far back on the hit ahead of it or behind it. And sure. you're creating this feeling mm-hmm. that is not seemingly, I mean, I'm not in his brain, but the, but the first and foremost thing is probably I'm trying to evoke a feel and a mood and, and, and a thing. Mm-hmm. I'm not just being set on out like, is this metronomically right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a part of drum culture of which I'm sure you've interacted with that tries to go into straight just school mode on everything. Huh, like yeah, how sure. can how can we analyze this? Sure. How can we take it apart? And it, this happens with every instrument, but I feel like in drums it's it's funnier sometimes. Yes. And and I see people you know transcribe his stuff, and it's like I'm sure that helps someone. You know, and I. But we both know Lenny, and he ain't thinking it like that. No, he will admit. I think he'll admit that. I, I can't put words in his mouth, but I feel like he would be like, yeah, I don't, I don't know what that is. Well, not even I don't know what that is. 
I'm not trying for it to be something that's so hyper analytical. Sometimes it's not about the exact notes. It's about like, you know, an atmosphere. It's about a, a feeling, you know, and, and Lenny's doing that. Lenny's playing samples. I mean, the music that him and I have listened together is like shit, like knowledge, you know, course, like, yeah. like that producer. So shit is so glitchy. Or, or you know, the, the people that helped me do my EP, the the cats yeah. down in um, down in San Antonio, the expansions Which of two guys, yeah. like super special young talents, and all their shit is like kind of in four, <laughs> you know, like, and I just the way they record, like the way they record, you know, to me was so foreign, but it gives it such a mood where it's like, yeah, this thing's in like four and a half, and you hear it, and you're yeah. like, oh yeah, this is like really laid back. It's like no, it's in four and a half because that, that's right, just right, how right, they right. did it. They That's lived nuts. it at four and a half yeah, of and they liked it and it, they should because it was killing. Right. <laughs> like, I mean, and I've, I've had situations where, you know, I do a decent amount of production with groups of my own or for mm -hmm. other people. And, and sometimes the question becomes, do you, do we record to a click or do we not? Mm -hmm. Did it with this group, Mr. Barrington, which is still my favorite group I've had that I've had a hand in. It's fucking killing You know, them. I really, I, I felt like that never got its full due, although yet it's got plenty of due and, and, yeah. and a lot of people have come up to me over the years, but I think it's, it's still undiscovered by a lot of people. The, the, we did three albums, but the way we arrive at things a lot is we jam out sections, sure. hoping to find a hook or we jam hoping to find a tune, you know? And sometimes we put a click on or sometimes we get the, the, the feeling, let's just not in case we want to like modulate a tempo or, or we want to experiment just for whatever reason. And sometimes we play with no click and after the fact we like something and we're a little bummed that like, Ah, if we'd done that with a click, we can cut the sections up easier. Mm -hmm. You know, we could have an A section here and we know that the B section would be same tempo or we can take a lick that happened from the keyboard and in letter B and it would fit tempo-wise in letter A. But mm -hmm. when you do it with no click, sometimes it skates. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we'd sit there and I'd cut up the sections and we wouldn't lay it up to a click and we're just using our ear and we're like these sections and we can't really loop them over a four bar grid because they're not exactly four bars to that tempo because the next four bars are faster mm -hmm. <laughs> and with technology you can take something into logic or ableton and time stretch them perfectly you can mm -hmm. quantize it mm -hmm. but something gets lost there to us sometimes we did do that and it was great but mm -hmm. sometimes like nope the magic's gone so we'll end up taking a bar three from this thing that happened three minutes later and it's a little faster, but we like the feel of that bar there and we're going to pull it in and so be it. Yeah. We listen back and we're like, that's still sounding like music to us. Can't put a click to this. And recently somebody wanted a track mm -hmm. off a Barrington album that I tried to grab the instrumental and, and find. Mm -hmm. and I was having a hard time looping it. I was like, why... It says in my in my logic file, you know, blah, 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 87 BPM. Mm -hmm. And that was just what I wrote, but it wasn't. That was done to no click. And it took me like an hour to realize, why can't I grab that section and why isn't it sitting? Yeah. It's because the whole track is not in time. Sure. But you'd never know with listening to it. I think that there's a lesson in that because people get really rigid in how they create or they think they have to create a certain way. Just saying like, yeah, whatever you play, like if you loop it, it's a loop. <laughs> and sometimes the best loops are those. Yeah. No question. Well, I, even tunes. I mean, shit, I remember hearing, if you play the first 10 seconds of Chameleon versus the last 20 oh, seconds right. of Chameleon. Oh, right. We all know that. It's like 30 clicks different. It's so, it's just madness, you know? Like, man, we we didn't touch one of these questions and I'm really happy about it. You probably have enough for the podcast right here. Oh, absolutely. I, I have to... But ask a few of them for crying I, 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 I want to hear at these. Least give, there's two of them. Good. I really want to dive into. I want to hear your opinion on mm. these things. Who intimidates you musically? Wow. So many people. Give me, give me like two or three. Uh, Lewis Cole. Why? Why is that one? He plays, he plays certain things in a way that I want to and I can't. Oh, uh, shit. Continues to keep going and, and keep pushing it. And it's mm -hmm. not easy because a lot of people will rest on their laurels and they will plateau. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And he's one of the rare people who has it. I feel like I don't even want to go any further. And not because I don't have <laughs> no, anybody it, else. Yeah, but no, I feel great. if I name one or two or three more, then what about the other? You know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. But like, I will say this, like some of my closest friends in the drum industry, and I know I'll leave some people out here too, <laughs> but th th they'll know that these are like the core these days. But yeah, like, yeah. you know, uh, I have a thing called Measure sure. that I've started. And I started it basically because me and Mark Juliana and Nate Wood would in various forms over the years form these double or triple bills. Mm -hmm. And we're all buddies. Like, you know, it's not like we just show up on the bandstand. Like me and Mark 
for years, you know, now he's got a family, he's touring a lot. But before that, I mean, we were, we talk every day and we were like, you know, two uh, chatty uh, high school girls on the phone. We even had a an act about that, that we were Tara and Becky from the mall, you know, we'd, <laughs> we'd greet each other and find I'm letting Mark, I hope I'm not embarrassing you. But we're like these two, like, you know, gabbing kids. But we were very, very tight. And we, you know, talk more about where we were going to get a burger and what milkshake we liked at this restaurant as much as we talked about what sticks we were using. You mm-hmm. know, we did double bills and triple bills. We thought, you know, this would be so fun to just be able to do this more, more than once a year. Mm-hmm. So we thought, let's pool our our ideas together and maybe form this like thing that maybe we can box into an, an evening mm. and sell it and package it and go around different cities. Now, Dan Weiss is, a, is another one involved. He's amazing. Mm. Josh Dion, who's in Paris Monsters, Jesus, just incredible. And Lewis has done a couple with us. Mm-hmm. But like, you know, these guys have all been heavy, heavy, heavy drum influences on me. Mm-hmm. Just by virtue of a, of course they're talented. That that's that's the big one. But like just hanging around and and, and talking and mm. trading ideas and and like they've definitely re inspired stuff. And I think let me let me scan the ages of everybody. I'm definitely I think the oldest of all of them. Yeah. And a lot of them would agree that like you know they grew up listening to me on a Wayne Krantz album in 1995 mm. and, and thought about how to improvise in a context like that due to that album. Mm-hmm. And I'm telling them that they've made me realize how to improvise and play drums because I'm listening to them. You know what I mean? So That's wonderful. So, and I'm getting inf- inspiration from them, and mm-hmm. they'll come back and me and say, "No, we're just taking your stuff." And I'm like, "I don't think you are." That actually takes me pretty deep into the last question okay. I was going to say, which is wonderful, and it it may even answer it. Okay, because you're you're touching on. Uh, possibly beneficial cyclical nature of how all this shit works with younger musicians. The, the question I was going to ask you was, was to see what your opinions were on whether there is a, a duty or maybe even just a benefit in, you know, musicians who are older. And I say older, just relative to whoever the young cats are sure, sure. to educate, you know, is it, is it more important to educate or more important to stay out of the way you know, and let them learn. Oh, interesting. Wow. And I hope I'm understanding the question properly, but like, I feel like you can educate someone without even, even meeting the person. If they're influenced by your playing, like if Nate Wood said he liked the Wayne Krantz album. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't sit down with him and talk to him about that album. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell him this is how we did it. He took what he wanted from that. And again, I, I hear like maybe 0.001% of that album in his playing I hear 99% Nate Wood. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like these days I'm more a student of somebody like Nate Wood than he is of me, mm. than, he, than he ever has been of me. I feel like when I was growing up formative years and checking out the guys when I was in my teens, that was me as a student. And, I, and then I felt like I've always been a student, but you know, like in the drumming front, I took a turn because I got into production and electronic music and I veered away and, and multimedia and I'm still doing that. So like I, I didn't veer into being like this transcribing drum student anymore, you know? But then as I've gotten older again, I feel like, again, I'm revisiting the student of myself and checking out younger guys and being like, wow, these guys, in my humble opinion, are doing it better than I am. Mm -hmm. And I really mean that. That's not paying lip service. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm happy that they are because they're making me better. Sure. You know, I'm learning more. I'm uh, realizing that there's more that I want to be able to figure out how to do and and again, figure out how to do and interpret in your own way. So mm-hmm. not just take verbatim, mm-hmm. but take tools and realize that, wow, like they don't have a weak hand on the drums like or a weak limb. Like it almost seems like things you would have only practiced syncopations on your bass drum, they practiced it on their hi-hat foot. <laughs> where I was like, I don't have time for that. I just got to get the bass drum together. <laughs> and you realize, no, they've got it there too. Yeah. And it's not so that they can just play a pattern on the hi-hat instead of a bass drum pattern. It's not about that. It's about what it does to your brain mm-hmm. and how it opens up other things. Like if you want to play, like I, I guess there might be equivalent on the keyboard where you reverse your hands on the keyboard and play your bass in the right hand. Sure. Or yeah. This way, you know, with your left, but up hot, you know, bass with your right hand. And you're like, why would you do that? You can just do it because it yields something else. It it opens up something that may you're not using that, but you're using it in another way. So yeah. I oh, yeah. felt I I never thought knew how weak my left hand was, and I'm left-handed. Hmm. My left hand on the drum set still is weaker than my right. If if I had to play a gig one-handed, I would do it with my right. Mm-hmm. 
my left hand is weaker. The drummers I love, it doesn't seem like it's much weaker for them. So I was like, why don't I try to reverse things and play the same grooves leading with up? Not so I can do it to play the groove that way. But to open up some pathways. To something else. Yeah. And it works. I feel like that's a really good approach. I mean, not only does it, it help you stay on your toes, but it helps you kind of, you know, avoid the, like, I sometimes think we get, and I, I definitely have even gotten here with the one or two eras I've dealt with, but you get to these modes where it's like, oh yeah, that generation doesn't have this thing, like, you know, fuck it or whatever, or like, you know, we have this and, and that's more important. And I, I think that that's a really good way to kind of make all this work together to realize that each each era is going to have like shit to take from i mean i obviously i'm hearing older generations and i hear like a larry goldings who like didn't at all grow up with the technology i had but doesn't need any of it to sound like a god to me you That's know right. and he's talking to me about like huh. which profit should i buy sure, and sure. what you know what's the benefit to this void and blah 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 sure and and that thing to me is just such a it's like such a beautiful thing about music because it really shows you that like this thing is a continuous path upwards and there's always a positive way it's, it's like even looking at someone who's the young fireballer who's who's you know getting all the new gigs or whatever maybe they take your work but that's a a, a positive because you're like damn why you know what where do i have to shift how can i grow and it's it's going to make you even better you know, because you're taking, like you said, you're taking their approach and putting no it doubt. into your pathways. And it's a really weird feeling when for many, many, many years, not just like initially, you're constantly thought of as like the new young hot guy, not just for a year, but several years and several mm -hmm. years. And you're always looked at by those older musicians with a little that, oh, that young guy, yeah. oh man, mm -hmm. he's getting, you know, when I was 17, I kept getting calls from like, once you, it, it's almost like it's feast or famine. You get mm. called by a few people and you're making the circuit and you're going to get called by again and again. Yep. And the phone would ring every day and it'd be someone else. I don't get one of those calls, but once in five years now, mm -hmm. I used to get them almost weekly mm -hmm. from this band to this, to you want to do this album because when you're on the tip of someone's tongue, you're on the tip it's of someone's the, tongue. You're the new toy. And they all want you. Sure. And I wasn't spooked by it, but it's so weird being that guy mm. to now feeling like, wait a minute, am I the old, the old man in this equation? You know, when, and I'm looking at these young kids with like, oh my God, but yet I was one of those. Yeah. It was, it's not like I look at them with like, man, I only, and I do sometimes slip and go, man, I just wish I was that, I, I, I was that, but I was. And it, and it's gonna you're you're not gonna be that forever. And, and that's that's one and, of the reasons you know, I brought up the question too is because I you know I I feel like you and I are both and and hella people in our scene are are now experiencing that where there's the the young burners and a, a part of me wants to go like you know it's fine like you're you're going to at some point have to deal with this situation that I'm now in. Sure, we all are, <laughs> but. I think I think my conclusion now is that like there's no use in them hearing that yet. I didn't want to hear it. Not I didn't want to hear it. I could do nothing with that information. Exactly. Yeah. It's like even even if ten I people who loved you who really cared, you can't, can't process it sometimes at that age or to the extent that they're trying to send you the message. So yeah. that's almost pointless in a way. Yeah. It just will happen when it happens, and when it happens, you'll realize, wow, okay, like, oh that's shit, what they that meant. was the thing that those. That's what they meant, <laughs> yeah. and I've had that a lot of times. Yeah. But what I can say about this, yes, we all get all the yes. There's some newcomers, but I do truly believe that if. If you really just sincerely have a yearning to push yourself forward and constantly learn and not like look at this as any defeat of someone can do this faster or better because there's always going to be that. Mm -hmm. But can they continually reinvent and um, expand on their recipes? Mm -hmm. And I do feel that at, at the point of the career I'm at, I feel I'm the best version of myself. Absolutely. I don't feel like the 16-year-old Zach has anything on me. Yeah. In fact, has way less on me. So like there's that. So when I say all that stuff, yeah. I I will take this Zach over that one. And I hope to take the 60 and 70-year-old Zach mm -hmm. over the current Zach. But that's a that's a frame of mind. It, well, and it's and know? that's I think a really great place to strive for because that that shows that that you have battled yourself and not someone else. And if you can realize that like your path is through yourself and improving yourself and not worrying about this and that and this and that and this other thing, even if it involves those, 
you can draw from it. Yeah, and, exactly. And you probably should. Yeah, Otherwise, well, well, then you might become old sooner than you'd like. Sure, to. sure. You know, um, but but you know, making it more about like a self improvement and not necessarily trying to like defeat a scene or something. I, I just think there's so much more. I, happiness isn't the word, but like I feel like there's more like wisdom and enlightenment. Oh, no doubt that. about it. That's just evolution, and and that's just the way things. That's cyclical, and that's the way life should be. Yeah, I wouldn't be playing the drums right now mm. if it weren't for some of the people I mentioned. Oh, absolutely. Like I would have stopped. Yeah, had I not heard Mark Juliana, I might have gotten stale in two thousand and four or something before I. I, heard, can, I think know. I can say that too, and I'm not even a drummer. You know what I'm saying? So like, <laughs> yeah. I need these guys. Sure, I need them for my own inspiration. I think that is a wonderful place to uh, tail this off. We I think done, so, uh, especially when we're mid second quarter in game three. Actually, <laughs> oh, I don't yeah, know what, there's, I don't know there's where a very we are. Uh, there's a very important game going on. We we yeah, should probably check on. out. Zach Danziger, I will end this by thanking you. As you know, I'm a person who tries to push the boundary, and I you know, are one of the few who, in your career, has continuously kept stepping up, and that's that's. You know, I don't know if it sounds like a compliment, but there's very few people that that keep climbing the stairs. And you have shown me that it's not only possible, but uh, anyway, thank you for being thank a you. beast. And uh, everyone check out all of Zach's projects. Um, they're all fucking unreal. Keep an eye open on Zach's Instagram, which is uh, at what? Again, remind me. Kind of close to my name, I think. Yeah. yeah. Zach Danziger. <laughs> at Zach Danziger. That's, uh, that would be it. That would be it. Yeah, <laughs> Amazing. Thank, thank you, Zach. You. Thank you. Thank you.